Good morning, and welcome to this week's second episode of the Ask Dr. Murphy series. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you this morning? Doing quite well. Dr. Robert Murphy is the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, and public health questions each week here on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be answering viewer-submitted questions, addressing the latest headlines, and our lone abbreviated U.S. COVID statistic through today, December 6th. We invite you to submit any questions you have down below or at any of our social media linked in the description. Starting with that abbreviated COVID statistic, average COVID deaths per day in the last reported week were 53, while in the same week last year, we saw 199 daily COVID deaths. Dr. Murphy, your reactions to those numbers and the general state of COVID. Yeah, they're, um, they're not really changed over the last few weeks. Uh, and the good news is it's a lot less than what happened in 2023, where some 73,000 people died. So we're seeing half or less uh, of the deaths. So we expect then for 2024 that the number of deaths from COVID will be less than half of what it was reported in 23. The wastewater surveillance um, is low. That's good. So, in other words, the, the in a just a general sense, the um, uh, uh, COVID pandemic is still at a very low level. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say how, had, but it's low. Yes, and we had a follow up question from one of our viewers regarding those data points. They ask, "It's mentioned that there is just a single COVID data point, the deaths." But as we mentioned, the wastewater is also often tested. Does wastewater te testing give an idea of the trends in COVID-19 as well as the number of deaths? If so, can you explain? Yeah, no, the, they're, they're measuring two different things. Um, there's how much COVID is in the wastewater uh, is just showing a trend for the overall numbers of cases. Uh, if a lot of people were infected, the wastewater would be high. So it's likely that the wastewater will go up before anything happens in terms of mortality, because it takes many weeks or months for a person to actually to succumb to the disease if they are going to die from it. So, um, and that unfortunately uh, for us now, the uh, the only metric that they really follow is the how many deaths, um, mm -hmm. because when you die, it's it's a formal procedure. There's a death certificate. There's a cause of death, and it's a reportable disease. So the State Departments uh, must report uh, the number of deaths for a variety of diseases, including uh, including COVID. So it's the only metric we're really following right now. So what this is saying is it's a lot better than last year. And right now, the there's been no jump in the number in the amount of COVID that's out there. Mm -hmm. Which is very good news. What that we'll keep our eye on, of course. But our second question from today comes from another viewer who asks. Is there any truth to the information being posted online that there is bird flu virus found in wastewater in St. Petersburg, Florida? If so, what is the significance, especially to someone who is immunocompromised? Well, that's a good question uh, because this is not followed as closely as uh, the COVID uh, cases. Um, there is a little truth to the finding and that uh, the system has uh, tracked avian flu in wastewater in November. And they had a sample test positive from Pinellas County. Uh, and um, uh, it's the only detection that's been found in the state of Florida uh, since uh, October. Um, more detections have been found. Uh, most detections to date have been found in California, actually. Um, but this may have something to do with, you know, how much, how many people are actually doing this? How many people are testing? Is the surveillance system, how big is the surveillance system? We don't really know. We know the system that's set up for COVID is actually really very good. Uh, for avian flu, um, I'm not so sure. So it depends how much you test, uh, it, you know, may have a, a factor here. But the other thing is we don't know if this is, avian flu from an animal, a bird, for example, or uh, if it's from a human. 
So we can't tell. And we know that when the birds get it, I mean, they spread it between themselves and, and have a very, very high mortality. So um, it's not as helpful as in the, the cases of COVID. Mm -hmm. If you are someone who's immunocompromised, would that one data point be sounding off alarm bells for you? Or is the risk to the general public still low? No, it's still low. Okay, very good to know. Yep. Now, looking back into COVID, one of our big stories today is a new study published on long COVID being linked to air pollution and how those two may interact. Can you break down the findings for us? Yeah, this is a, um, a study from Barcelona uh, looking at 2,800 uh, adult COVID survivors um, from Northeastern uh, Spain. And what they found was that one in four um, of these patients reported persistent symptoms lasting more than three months. So we always, we sort of define COVID as, you know, if you still have symptoms at three months, it's long COVID. Now in this group, um, after two years, it was only 5%. So three, at three months, about a quarter of the people are still having some kind of symptoms. And then they looked at the risk factors of those that were having long COVID at, at three, having still having symptoms at three months. It was more women than men, um, people with lower educational attainment. So what does that mean? You know, more like people that could be working uh, in with more more interactions uh, with the public. I mean, most likely that's what it is. Underlying medical conditions, we've known that from the beginning. And if they had severe COVID versus mild COVID, which all makes sense because we know with severe COVID, there's more long COVID. Um, vaccination conferred a protective effect. Those that were vaccinated, when you control for other or those factors, had uh, they had less long COVID. Um, it, I mean, it was pretty dramatic, 15.4% versus 46%. So um, the the bottom line is, and, and then the the exposure, the uh, the estimated exposure to air pollution was also associated um, with uh, long COVID, but it most likely is making the infection more severe, which raises the amount of lingering symptoms over time. So. Mm -hmm. Um, is probably the underlying disease caused from the pollution than the pollution really directly. It's more of an indirect effect is what the hypothesis is that they're saying here. But I think the very, very other take home point is that after three months, and this is the second study we've actually mentioned in the last couple of weeks that shows that long COVID is, is much more common than we thought. Absolutely. And something that we will keep up to date on and mm -hmm. keep trying to find the newest literature to present to you. But one of our other long, long running studies is that of the avian flu here in the US and worldwide. There's been more talks about the consumption of raw milk products and some of the recalls that have been going on there. Can you fill us in on all that's happened? Yeah, so um, raw milk, uh, this is a big issue right now because the uh, proposed head of the Department of Health and Human Services, a big proponent of uh, raw milk, thinks it's much better for you. Uh, there's very little data that shows that pasteurization takes away many benefits from milk. Um, and um, this is now the second case where avian flu was found in raw milk. Now, that, nobody should be surprised at that because the cattle have it. Uh, many herds have it. Now, what does that mean? Can that spread then from the milk to a human? We don't know. There's no human bird flu cases linked to uh, consumption of milk so far. Uh, but you know, how many people drink raw milk? Uh, it's not. It's not a lot of people. Um, we know that with pasteurized milk, uh, even in herds that are infected with uh, avian flu, that uh, the, the milk is sterilized. So you can you can eliminate the virus with just the routine pasteurization. But I think people have to remember that that doesn't mean there's no risk that they haven't found a human getting avian flu from this. You know, the virus is changing all the time and who knows how contagious it's going to be. And we don't really know. So, but keep in mind, raw milk has been associated with a variety of disease causing pathogens. Listeria, 
Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli, and now avian flu. Um, you have to be very careful, especially pregnant women. Um, exposed to listeria can cause a uh, miscarriage and stillbirth and I mean, all, all sorts of uh, bad things. So it's, um, uh, it, raw milk is, is a very risky thing to get involved in. And is the public health benefit from drinking pasteurized milk worth the risk of getting these diseases? That's a personal decision. Uh, you can make it, but some of these other diseases that I just mentioned can cause a lot of problems. Absolutely. That. Yeah, that brings to mind the uh, listeria outbreak tied to deli meats. I believe it was boar's head specifically that uh, we saw a few months head, ago. Yeah. It's the same bacteria, but it can also be in milk. Mm -hmm. And sticking on the topic of food and pathogens, the CDC and officials have cleared the risk linked to an E. coli outbreak with McDonald's onions. Can you break down the entire thing? What happened from start uh, to finish? Yeah, so it, this E. coli outbreak where uh, 104 people in 14 states got sick, 34 of them got hospitalized, four developed potentially life-threatening kidney disease complications, and one person died. So that's what can happen when this these very severe E. coli uh, infections get out into the population. Well, anyhow, just finding the source, cutting off the source, good public health measures have stopped this little mini epidemic. So that's all really, really good news. So um, uh, it just shows you the, the benefits of, of good public health um, activity. And so that that is over. And then if we just back up a second to the, um, um, sorry to bounce around, but with the, the bird flu cases, um, uh, the, we have had 55 human cases of bird flu in 2024. Uh, 29 have been in California, most of them in farm workers. Um, and there is a stockpile of bird flu vaccines uh, in the United States made by three companies. And the British Health Security Agency, that's their major central health department, has contracted with one of the companies for 5 million doses in case this thing gets out of hand. So just, just another sort of you know, let's get ready in case something really goes wrong here. Absolutely. And and good to know that our public officials and our health agencies are taking those steps, but a little bit scary to think about that we could have something else on our hands here. Right. Now, something scary that is newly on our hands is a mystery potential respiratory illness coming out of Congo. Can you tell us all there is to know? Yeah, this just uh, popped up in the news uh, recently. So Congo, right in Central Africa, very large uh, country, uh, Kinshasa is the capital. Um, they have identified in the southern part of the country about 380 cases of this flu-like illness where 143 people have died from it. This is like, they don't know what it is yet. That's 37% mortality rate. Uh, it's affected mostly in children. Adults can get it as well. Um, and, um, you know, people are dying in the hospitals and also in the community before they can even get to the hospitals. So it's being um, investigated by WHO and the African CDC as we speak. Uh, hopefully we'll have some answers very soon because this is how these pandemics start they have to start someplace and we don't even know what this this thing is what kills 37 percent of people a flu-like illness so it's uh it's just another reason why we have to keep uh our fingerprint um over uh our footprint actually all over uh, the world and uh, help these countries uh, do the surveillance that's necessary to uh, to figure out what these uh new up-and-coming pathogens really are and how we can prevent their spread. Absolutely. And there has been some criticism on public health of seemingly spending money here and there and all over the place, but it's exactly for this reason. You need to be able to survey and be on the ground when these things pop up. The kind of money we're talking about uh, compared to the entire budget, even just the entire health budget is pennies, just a very small part. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. This is a story we will keep on the top of our list to look after. But on that note, we have run out of our time. Lists, I'm sure. Uh, first, we have oh, to figure yeah. out what it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's going to be a lot, a lot of looks. Something that's reemerged? Is this something that's old? That we, who knows? We don't know. Yeah. Hopefully, we will find out very soon. But on that note, thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for answering our viewers' questions, taking us through the headlines and all the newest data. It's much appreciated. Well, thank you, Katie. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Ask Dr. Murphy series. We hope to see you net back next week. And of course, if you have any questions or suggested topics, please leave them down below in the comments or any of our social media linked in the description. Talk to you next week.